to deliver oxygen. There is no living regenerative tissue that can heal without oxygen. And we know this, what the party already mentioned before, we know the dry socket syndrome. If there is no breathing, we will have the dry socket syndrome and no bone regeneration. So what is the second step? In the second step, we need the fibro cartilaginous callus formation. If we don't have this callus, it doesn't heal, the bone cannot heal. So this is the second step. And we know this, once we don't have a dry socket, but uh, the alveolar fills with blood, then it forms this uh, fibrocartilaginous callus, and this cartilaginous callus then will ossify by mineralization. In the third step, we of course need a bony callus formation. That means we need regenerative osteoblasts that mineralize the collagenous basic texture of the bone. So once again it is general medical knowledge that the bone fracture does not heal without remineralization by osteoblasts. And we know this and this is a process that takes time and that we can just influence for instance by PRF, I will demonstrate it then afterwards, but it takes time. The larger the bone defect yield is, the longer it takes. The bigger the augmentation site is, the longer it takes until it heals. Because it is dictated by nature and not by some funny protocols that are sometimes issued in the current literature. And of course we have to respect that there are limits in bone regeneration. We are speaking about large bone defect healing so-called critical size defects, which we know from cyst surgery because we have a contraction of the blood clot and this contraction of the blood clot, if the size of the cyst is too big, will prevent a sufficient bone regeneration of the cyst cavity. So in history, this was overcome by stabilized blood clots. Nowadays, we can use uh, biomaterials to fill the cyst and the best right now to do is to mix bone grafts, biomaterials with APRF because the APRF is a specialized, highly biologically active blood clot. It's just a blood clot without uh, erythrocytes. And we have to take into consideration 
the bone undergoes a constant remodeling. Bone undergoes a remodeling on our extremities, but it also happens the same way in our jaws. So, once again, it is general medical knowledge. If bone is not loaded with physiological width, bone gets a trophy. But when you overload it, it will also get uh, resorbed. How do we know this? Now you will wonder why I show you an astronaut, but this is exactly the problem astronauts face. Why? Because the lack of proper physiological bone loading leads to atrophy of every bone in mammals, as does overload lead to bone resorption. So we speak about the biological bone load width. We know this from the atrophy pattern that happens after tooth extraction, but we know this also from orthodontics. If we overload the bone by higher loads, which we use in orthodontics, we will have a bone resorption. On the other hand, by the periodontal ligament, you have the pole on the bone and you have appositional bone growth. So, this should be made clear that overloading of the bone, for instance, with very short implants, but also under uh, lack of loading the bone, leads to atrophy and bone resorption. This leads us then to the well-known atrophy pattern uh, after tooth extraction, which happened to take place very quickly after tooth extraction. And of course, it makes uh, alveolar ridge augmentation or bone augmentation absolutely mandatory to insert dental implants. Of course, we can prevent this. Dr. Pauti already uh, said it before. We can do soccer preservation. Nowadays, we do this with uh, PRF mixed with uh, uh, biomaterials. So I don't get in, uh, deeper into this detail. But now it is very, very important to know which tissue is responsible for bone healing. And this is one of the most important um, facts that you always have to keep in mind when you do oral surgery and bone augmentation because we are speaking about the physiology of end and periosteum. And it is already proven that without periosteum there is no bone healing. It's impossible because periosteum is the only carrier of bone regeneration, providing the preosteoblast to remineralize the collagenous tissue formation that spreads after the lesion of the bone. This was proven already in uh, 2009, also for the maxillofacial region, as I'm a maxillofacial surgeon with specialization in traumatology and reconstructive surgery. Uh, we have a lot of cooperations with uh, uh, cosmetic surgeons, and you can see here one of the reference literature which is very interesting to read because here you will find the histologic proof that without uh, periosteum and endosteum there will never ever be bone healing. This is uh, another slide from this uh, publication. And once you're able to keep the periosteum intact, then of course you don't have to block it with membrane. This is you heard uh, the speech of Dr. Palti before. He, pre he told you to always place uh, membranes when you do open sinus lifting. Yes, because maybe you destroyed the periosteum simply by pre preparing a not perfect new periosteal flap. In case you're able to do this, then of course you don't have to use membranes because you're blocking the osteoblast activity from the periosteum. But what is periosteum exactly? You can see here um, a histological slide of one of our histologic studies. The periosteum in its um, entirety is substructured in a fibrous uh, layer and in the osteogenic layer. And this is the so-called cradle of osteoblasts. And this is well known in general medicine since uh, 50, 60 years. But we as oral surgeons have to take into consideration that successful oral surgery and bone augmentation starts with the precise preparation of a mucoperiosteal flap. Here you can see also the endosteum because in the uh, squamous bone, all small trabecular of the squamous bone, they are also covered with periosteum. 
And this is why you sometimes have to punch and pinch into the bone to provoke a bleeding, not to receive the blood, but to receive the pre-osteoblasts from the end osteum, once you destroy maybe the period. And of course, and this is very, very important, the sinus membrane is nothing else but periosteum. This we have to understand, there is no bone in the entire human body that is not covered by periosteum. And the sinus membrane is periosteum. Only the inside layer, the respiratory epithelium, is different from the squamous cells covering the periosteum in the oral cavity. And we were able to prove this also in one of our studies. This was published uh, back in 2014 when we did the investigation for our transgressed or intralift sinus lift procedure with the piezotome. And here you can see exactly the same structures, the fiber straight and the collagenous, which are, consists of collagenous fibers. And see the strut, the osteogenic layer, the cradle of osteoblasts. When you take a look at the histologic slide, you will see all these little red dots. And these little red dots are the pre-osteoblasts delivering the remineralization power of the augmentation side. This is very important. Keep the periosteum intact and you will be always successful in whatever you're doing in oral surgery. Now, let's get to chapter 3. How do implants and biomaterials also integrate precisely? Because mentally, we make a difference between biomaterials, bone augmentations, and insertion of the implants. But the physiology of osseo integration doesn't take care if we just pull out the drawer, okay, this is a dental implant, and we pull out the drawer, oh, this is biomaterial, we do augmentation surgery. No, for the body, it's exactly the same. And we also have to respect what is necessary to be predictable and successful in augmentation uh, surgery. So, what does osseo integration mean? Osseo integration means simply that biocompatible materials integrate seamless into healing bone. And it's a biological fact that the body doesn't care, the bone doesn't care if the material we put inside the bone is made of titanium, zirconia oxide, PEEK, xenogenic biomaterial, beta TCP, hydroxy, appetite, and bioblasts. They are all foreign bodies, but they are biocompatible and they will also integrate. So, you can see in one of the studies, our partner team at the University of Zurich performed with a self-hardening bone graft material called EasyGraft, um, compared with the osseointegration of a zirconia implant. You see that the biomaterial is also integrated the same way as an implant. And this is very important to understand that if you insert an implant and you place also biomaterial, it's the same process. The bone also integrates not only the titanium implant or whatsoever material the implant is made of, but also the biocompatible biomaterial we do the augmentation with. This is very important to understand. And then you will know if you have failures what the real cause of the failure is because it's not the implant, it's not the biomaterial, maybe it's the preparation technique and destroying the periosteum. So, physiology of osseo integration, what is the key point to be successful? Once again, it's very simple. I know we know this in, in traumatology especially me as a uh, traumatological maxillofacial surgeon. You can see here on the uh, left upper side, this is a, a fracture of the condyl. We have to do an osteosynthesis. Why do we have to do it? Because we have to immobilize the fracture. And we know for a very long time that if you have an unstable fixation of any type of implant material, which could be a titanium implant, zirconia implant, or biomaterial, you will have a fibrous tissue ingrown. Contrary, if you have a stable fixation, which we call now primary stability, you will have bone ingrowth into the rough surface of the biomaterial or the dental implant. 
So, the key factor for successful Austrian integration simply is immobilization. And it has to be less the movement of the material inside the augmentation side or the implant inserted into bone has to be less than 100 micrometers. We know this in general orthopedic surgery since 60 years. Now it was verified also for dental implantology on the recently publication um, was issued last year. It's 100 micrometers. And this is what we call primary stability. What we need in bone augmentation surgery and dental implantology to be successful is primary stability, immobilization of the augmentation side. And this was also um, proven by a very, very famous professor, Professor Mamoto. She was able to prove that if, a, if an implant or a biomaterial inserted moves it blocks the vascularization because vascularization is mechanosensitive. And if you are able to achieve a primary stable augmentation site and achieve a primary stable implant, you will have vascular ingrowth and vascular ingrowth is the base of every type of bone healing and also integration. So, immobilization is the prerequisite for proper vascularization to enable osseointegration. If this is the only sentence you take home with you from this lecture, then I succeeded in transmitting to you the basic idea what you have to apply in your everyday's work on your patient to be successful and to minimize failures. So, as a summary, Bone healing and osteointegration by endosteum and periosteum are enabled best with minimal invasive surgery plus primary stable bone and graft implant. And this happens then to osteointegrate by first vascularization and then later on by undisturbed osteointegration. So that's the whole secret. If we know this in your in, in our everyday surgical procedure, we will be successful at a very, very high rate. But now, let's take a look about our responsibility toward our patients. Because as medical doctors, our primary task is not to do harm. We are dealing with patients, and the population grows older and older, especially in Europe. And these patients want to enjoy their lifetime. And of course, this lady that happens to have a lot of fun with skydiving, she has a certain problem. And of course, she will come to see you and ask you, please, I need implants. And of course, we know she will need sinus lifting, she will need maybe bone, uh, bone augmentation, etc., etc. But we should not interfere too much in, with her life. We should offer her predictable, minimal invasive surgical techniques. And a lot of these surgical techniques were already presented yesterday and today. Unfortunately, it was a too short time to, uh, to add Dr. Palti now. But just remember the lectures of uh, Professor Asari, Professor Makari, Professor Skadeci, and uh, Professor Vecellotti this morning. They were already pointing out, and this is the common sense you have to take home with you. And now, I'm happy to introduce you to a new concept in oral surgery. The new state of the art and gold standard in oral surgery that replaces the old techniques. We have certain key methods and one of the most important key methods is key method number one. Because when we do surgery, we have to cut bone, we have to manipulate bone. And the only device enabling an atraumatic and perfect and precise uh, bone cutting and bone management is ketotone surgery. Why is it like this? First of all, we know that ketotone surgery preserves and stimulates the full biological functionality of endosteum and periosteum by least traumaticity of bone and soft tissues by simply atraumatic bone cutting. Maybe you've seen the histologic slides of Professor Virginia this morning. We already have this, uh, the, the scientific proof and the histological proof. Second, K2 
Pietro bone surgery initiates bone healing with the first cut by ultrasonic cavitational stimulation of soft and hard tissue healing. Also, this is proven right now because the application of ultrasonic waves to both soft and hard tissues leads to enhanced production of vascular endothelial growth factor, bone morphine protein, and osteogenic cells. This is from the macroscopic to the microscopic level, there is no alternative to piezotome surgery anymore. Rotating instruments simply have to be abandoned completely for the sake of our patients. And piezotome surgery leads to 50% less patient morbidity. We were able to prove this in several studies. They were pub published in the last years. First of all, piezotome surgery, when we start the procedure. I mean, we are all preparing new osteo flaps, but this is just something we put aside. But this step is crucial in, for the success of our surgery. If we do it sloppy, that means if we destroy the periosteum tube during the preparation, we already have the first step towards failure of our surgery. So, piezotone surgery preserves and stimulates the full biological functionality and this starts with the mucoperiosteal flap. It was proven by us during our study for the subperiosteal tunnel technique, and it was also proven by Stelzer and Aliab, which uh, made a microscopic investigation of the effects of uh, piezoelectric devices on periosteal microcirculation after subperiosteal preparation. So, also not using piezotone surgery on only hard bones, but also pre uh, preparing new coperiosteal flaps with piezotone enhances the pre predictability and the success of your entire surgery. Then, once again, we speak about the sinus lifting. Um, I'm very proud because me and my research group, we developed uh, back in 2007 the first transcrestal hydrodynamic ultrasonic cavitational sinus lift system, which is now called the intralift. With this, as you can see in the histological slide, with this, this is one of the very, very few surgical procedures that provide the absolute perfect detachment of the sinus membrane from the, from the bony floor because we use hydrodynamic pressure on the body and the ultrasonic cavitational effect. And this keeps the sinus periosteum intact and provides the best results in bone regeneration when we do big sinus lifting. Here you can see a clinical photo from our experimental studies. Now, a group around uh, uh, Professor Reside in the United States they were also able to prove that when you compare rotary instruments with uh, piezo bones, you see that you have a much enhanced bone healing. You see it on, uh, on the second row. Because you have a cleaner bone cut and you already initiate the bone healing with the first cut of your piezo bone osteotomy. This is very important to know because isn't it beautiful? You just cut the bone and you initiate the bone healing while you're doing the surgery. Now, what is the benefit for your patients and what is the benefit for your image in this oral surgery? We were, my research group and me, we were the first ones back in 2011 to prove that with the only application of pietrophone surgery, we were able to reduce patient morbidity, pain, <coughs> swelling, hematoma, edema, etc., etc., by more than 50%. When we take the rotating instruments administration with 100% pain, swelling, and post surgical morbidity, <coughs> you can see the result, which happens to be well, more than 50% less post surgical patient morbidity. And of course, this is not only our findings, because there were a lot of um, research groups that doubted our results, because we were somehow a little bit called fanatics in piezotone surgery. But now, all these research groups, I just give you some samples of references, they were all improving our first results we made back in 2011 in a five-year uh, 
longitudinal randomized study on impact and third molars. Of course, there are also independent verifications of our research results regarding soft tissue preservation and safety and once again independent replications and verifications of the basic experimental studies regarding bone healing performed by Professor Bercelotti, uh, Dr. Reside, etc. etc. in our research group. So it's not a hope anymore, it's knowledge that piezotone surgery, that there is no alternative to piezotone surgery. Now let's speak about key method number two because until now we just spoke about precise and uh, automatic bone cutting. Key method number two is bone graft materials. As you might remember the lecture on the first day, there are almost no differences between different bone graft materials. If it's autologous or, it's, or it's xenogenic or synthetic, it doesn't matter, but we need a certain quality in bone graft materials comparable to autologous bone blocks. And so there is a new generation of bone graft materials which is self-hardening bone graft materials to resemble an autologous bone block. And we use this, why? Because these self-hardening bone materials uh, provide a full normalization <coughs> of the augmentation side. Remember the first part, what we need is immobilization. And if the bone graft hardens on the side, you have the proper immobilization like you have with the implants. And of course, they provide a slow resorbing and reinforcing microstructure for the regenerated bone, and they provide a stable long-term matrix to prevent natural atrophy. Because as you might remember, the lecture of Professor Azari showing his logic slides from a very long time period, you will always find in your augmentation site still remnants of the grafting material. If it's autologous bone or it's xenogenic bone, cow bone, pig bone, horse bone, kangaroo bone, whatsoever, you will find it. But we love to have this because they are reinforcing the biomechanical stability of the augmentation site. Now, this is not only a hope, this is also proven by a research group around Professor Schmidling, once again from the Zurich University. They were able to prove, first of all, that biomaterials also integrate exactly the same way as do dental implants, and that you have a very, very close appositional bone growth on the self-hardening bone materials. They compared it with granulate materials like bovine bone and uh, granulate uh, beta TCP. And of course, let's just go back once again, and of course the results are better than when compared to an empty space. You see, this is a critical size defect. The body is not able to fill this with bone in a once the defect is larger than between 5 and 6 millimeters. This we have to know. And this is why we don't need a bone augmentation or bone grafting when we do an epicentrum and we have a small bone defect. The body can manage this all alone. But once the defect is bigger than 5 to 6 millimeters, it's an absolutely mandatory procedure to fill this bone defect with biomaterials and nowadays best in a mixture with PRF to enhance the vascular ingrowth. So this is once again um, a study we performed which was, uh, which was uh, published 2014 in Nature Scientific Reports. We were comparing different biomaterials, how they behave when we apply them to the intralift procedure. And as you can see, the control group, normal bone, the insertion torque value of non-dental implants. We use the German implant system from Triangle Company. It's called the Cute Implant System, which has a very high primer stability and provides a high insertion torque force. But as you can see, in normal bone, in natural subcontrol bone, we achieve maximum 25 to 30 newton centimeters uh, insertion torque force. When we compare this with the self-hardening biomaterials, beta DCP, we already are above 45 newton centimeters, which is the magic, the magic uh, line when immediate low is possible. 
and it will be used by basic materials like easy graft containing hydroxy appetite plus pentatric calcium phosphate, we achieve the best results with more than 50 newton centimeters of insertion torque value. Now, we use this of course also for alveolar ridge preservation, just to give you an example. This is an extraction socket. The extraction was done with the piezo dome. Then we insert the Q1 implant. It's a single stage implant and we prefer to use a lot of these Q1 single stage implants. Why? We have no abutment. There is no gap between the abutment and the body of the implant. And the long-term stability and the risk of infectious diseases around the gap between the abutment and the implant body is very low. But, of course, we want to preserve the buccal bone aspect, so this is why we use self-hardening bone graft materials like easy graft, and this you can see is the result after four years. Now, let's speak about key method three. I will do this part short because Dr. Pike already presented this very extensively. We are speaking about advanced platelet rich fibrin, which we have to thank Professor Schubrun, who developed this uh, type of preparation of PRF. I just now answer the question why we have to use PRF. First of all, platelet rich fibrin enhances and concentrates the natural fibrin blood clot and enriches the blood clot by leukocytes granulocytes, vascular anterior growth factor, and bone morphine protein. That's the simple truth. It's just making the natural blood clot better. And this was the genius act by Professor Schubert. And I know him now for a very long time. We are very good friends. And I know what hard work it was to develop this technique. There were a lot of copies, but only his one really works and in scientific. Platelet rich fibrin then, as an effect, speeds up and enhances vascularization of the scaffold significantly by releasing the vascular endothelial growth factors. And platelet rich fibrin leads to faster and more stable and constant bone regeneration. Here you can see one, uh, some of the experimental works performed once again by Professor Mamoto, um, just checking about the uh, biological abilities of PRF. And here you can see a histomorphometric investigation that um, platelet-rich platelet -rich fibrin speeds up and enhances the vascularization of the scaffold significantly. Without PRF on the right side, with PRF uh, on the left side. This was published back in 2012 by uh, Professor Lose. But we were also able to put our share to APRF research because um, we utilized the uh, piezotone enhanced subperior of the tunnel technique. You can see here a clinical photo. We just prepared a superior of the tunnel with the piezotone. Then we applied the self hardening biomaterial easy graft. But the results of the study were very interesting. Once again, with normal bone applied to this study, we had the worst results concerning insertion torque value of the implants. But when we take the same bone graft material, Isograph Classic and Isograph Classic with PRF, you see a significant difference in the biomechanical quality of the bone. And this is an indirect proof that the addition of PRF to any bone graft material enhances the regeneration of the bone, the speed of the regeneration of the bone, and the biomechanical quality of the regenerated bone. And this is what we want to have when we insert implants into this bone. So now let's make a summary before we get into the everyday application of this new knowledge we have. Pizza bone surgery provides and preserves and stimulates the full biological functionality of endosteum and periosteum. Piezotone surgery initiates bone healing with the first cut by ultrasonic cavitational stimulation of soft and hard tissue healing. And it leads to more than 50% less patient morbidity, which is very good for your patients and very good for your image as oral surgeon. The self-hardening biomaterials, they provide a full immobilization of the augmentation site as a prerequisite for 
perfect bond generation and also integration of these materials. And since they are flow resolving, they are reinforcing the microstructure of the regenerated bone, which especially in the maxilla is, as we know, of a poor quality. And they give a stable long-term matrix to prevent natural atrophy, which is also very important. And platelet-rich fibrin, platelet-rich fibrin, last but not least, enhances and content concentrates the natural fibrin blood flow enriched by leukocytes, granulocytes, BEGF and bone morphine proteins, speeds up and enhances vascularization, and of course leads to faster and more stable and constant bone regeneration and wound epitalization. But how can we put this now into everyday practice? This is now science. But how can we put this into everyday practice in every dentist's office on this small beautiful planet? So, let's speak about, for instance, um, a case of narrow alveolar crests. What you can see here, this is um, once again part of our research work. Uh, we developed with the piezotome, the flapless piezotome enhanced vertical alveolar crest split. I just want to show you uh, the clinical procedure. This is the original situation. And this is the final result. Just to demonstrate what you can do with piezotones, because normally it is agreed that uh, vertical alveolar crest splitting and widening shouldn't be done if the alveolar crest width is less than two to three millimeters. Now we developed a special tip set for piezotones that allows us to really cut bone lossless. And in this case, the remaining alveolar crest width, as you can see on the left upper right uh, CBCD slide, was less than one millimeter. And we are able to do this. We are able to do this almost bone loftless. And piezotone surgery is the only surgery that allows us to do osteotomies around the curve. You cannot do this with rotating instruments at that precision. And you cannot do bone cuts around the curve with oscillating saws. So, this new field of piezotone surgery enables you to do procedures that were well known in theory before, but now they can be put in everyday practice. In our research work, our duty towards oral surgeons like you is that when we develop something, it has to be safe in everyone's hands, also in the hands of absolute beginners. And this is why we always test our developments before on special courses where absolute beginners uh, try these instruments and we modify it until we can tell you if you follow the protocol we provide, it's a very precise, precise protocol, then you will succeed with your first case. Of course, you shouldn't take extreme cases like this as your first case. So, once again, and this is also to prove that Eye-guided surgery, eye-guided implant insertion is still the best way to insert implants because it's always the best to start in the midline and then leave the drill inside the drilling hole as an orientation and parallelization aid and then you don't need any surgical guide because in procedures like this there is no way to use a surgical guide. So just rely on your eyes and the computer between your two ears. So in this case, we inserted eight implants. In the spaces between the eight implants, we insert the self-hardening biomaterial because we have want to have reinforced bone when the healing is finished. You can see here the application of this uh, easy graft material. I don't know if it's known here in Iran. Uh, you mix the granules with the biolinker then it gets uh, a sticky consistency. It's still mold uh, moldable at that stage. And then you just apply it to the surgical site. You can use it in sinus lifting procedures, in crest splitting procedures, or if you want to do vertical augmentations. And of course, if you uh, do the subperiosal tunnel technique, then it's almost mandatory to use a self-hardening bone graft material. So this is mixed with the bio to make the uh, 
biomaterial moldable, then it is applied to the site with the eight implants inserted, and it just takes about three to four, sometimes five minutes, until the moldable mass you applied is really rock hard. Because also in autologous home block, is nothing else but a scaffold builder. Because an autologous bone block after three hours contains no living cells, especially when we use compact bone autologous bone blocks. Because they are very, very cell poor and they just work so perfectly because you attach them with screws, they immobilize the augmentation site, and by this they wear for a very long time the gold standard. Only by this biomechanical stability and immobilization. Now we don't need autologous bone blocks anymore because we have the self hardening bone graft material that um, fulfills exactly the same tasks and even better when compared to autologous bone blocks. As you can see, it's already in the hardening stage because with the suction you cannot remove it. And since this was almost flapless, you can do a primary seal wound closure. And of course, normally in this procedure would have meant that you had to transplant autologous bone blocks from both sides of the chain, from the lateral ramus of the mandible. In this case, we just use the crest split technique, we use self-hardening bone graft material, and then we just suture up and after five to six months, you can load the implants. And it's the least traumaticity to the patient. And in this case also, the patient had very, very little swell. And on the left lower side, you can see the final result after implant insertion. So this is just one example how and why we should use only piezo tone surgery anymore. Now I give you a very similar example, like Tommaso this morning, Professor Vercellotti the removal of an impacted third molar. As you can see here, this is an impacted third molar in absolute vicinity to the mandible nerve with the big corona cyst. So how do we manage this with piezo bones? Very simple. Instead of destroying the bone by milling away the bone with rotary instruments, destructive, lot of bleeding, you just prepare a nice bone window on top, lateral top, of the impacted third molar in the cyst. You can see, this is, these are not faked uh, photographs. This is real life surgery transmission. Once the crown of the impacted third molar is revealed, you use the ligament cutter tips. They are ultrasonic ligament cutters to remove teeth. We use this also in case of impacted third molars. And once the tooth is loosened, we can just take it out without effort and without any pressure on the mandible nerve. Then we have to remove the cyst also with uh, ultrasonic surgical tools. In this case, from the sinus lift tip set, because they have very, very smooth edges, because we know we are working in close vicinity to the mandibular nerve. And here you can see then the final result. This is the mandibular nerve. And as you can see, also the perineurium and all the cover of the, uh, of the nerve is completely unharmed. You have almost no bleeding. You have clean access, clean view. This is only possible with pizza tone surgery. And whoever, ever, would have to remove an impacted third model like this with rotary instruments knows what I'm speaking about. It's poor stress for the surgeon and most of the patient will have a partial anesthesia or hypesthesia for quite a long period. But now, since this is a more than critical size defect, once again we have to reconstruct the site, which is very simple. We place APRF membranes on top of the mandibular nerve just to give a soft cushion for the later applied bone graft material mixed with IPRF, that's the newest development of Professor Shugun. It's the liquid injectable PRF. It makes the so-called sticky bone. That means you just apply it and then it gets moldable like the bone graft material, the synthetic bone graft material I showed you before. So once this is applied, you just put back the osteotomy plate 
on the bottle side. You don't need any fixation because you have absolutely precise cuts. In the video which you can uh, freely look on our YouTube educational channel from our academy, you will see the entire surgery. So, if you are interested, interested in you can look it up. And this is the situation before, and this is the situation then six months after. You see an even hyper-dense reorganization of this big cavity. And this is only and this is only possible when you combine ketosone surgery with APRF and, um, and a bone graft material that really speeds up the bone regeneration process. Now, let's take another example. The intralift we developed already since 2007 and since there are now a lot of competitors on the market that provide also hydrodynamic procedures um, we are very honored because it's a, it's a proof of concept. But we developed it back in 2006 and since 2007 we have uh, a lot of multi-center studies and it's one of the best investigated transgressive procedure uh, documented scientifically. Just to give you an idea how it works, this is the reference list of our clinical and histologic research. The procedure is very, very simple. Once again, when we do something, it has to be simple in your hands. It's just a six-step procedure. First, you prepare a pilot drill with a diamond-coated ultrasonic diamond, which we decide it's the TKW1 diamond. Then you prepare a uh, receptacle seat. Then you place a tip on top of this ventral seat and just with hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic pressure and the cavitation effect, you detach the sinus membrane from the sinus floor and then you are free to do, to do any augmentation you want to. Honestly speaking, since 2007, I never ever did any open sinus lift anymore. And when you look up our lectures and case presentations on our educational channel, on which I will give you the, the link to at the end of this lecture, you will see that you can really manage everything with intralift. For me, it completely replaced the lateral approach science lifting procedure. Just to give you an example so that it doesn't uh, stay just a promise I give you, um, this is the situation before on the left side, the situation afterwards on the right side. This is how you prepare a single approach mostly in the first molar region with the diamond coated TKW1 diamond. Then you proceed to open the sinus floor with the TKW2 diamond. This already opens the sinus floor. And then you prepare the ventral seat and you just attach this trumpet-like tip that seals the entrance to the sinus floor. And once you activate, within five seconds, you raise a volume of 2.5 cubic centimeters subantral bone volume, potential augmentation volume. Why? Because it's in the protocol which you strictly have to follow, and this resembles a fifth to a quarter of the volume of the entire human sinus floor in an average. And here you can see then the result after the sinus elevation in a slow move. You see all the water that was pumped under the sinus membrane, once you remove the trumpet, it flows back immediately. This gives you two securities, no perforation, and you see there is fresh blood coming out, that means the blood vessels are preserved. Here again you can do, of course, also a direct view, the Valsalva test. You see when the patient inhales, how the sinus membrane floats back and now you might be shocked. Maybe you have a perforation or you have not. Because when the patient exhales, the sinus membrane floats back again and you can always see slightly some blood drops coming out because it was a clean separation of the sinus membrane from the antral. So, and this is applicable in every situation. Even if you have only one millimeter of remaining subantral alveolar crest, you can apply this. And this is even the most safe method to start with this procedure because you are extremely fast and you have everything under visual control. Then, of course, you apply bone graft material. Nowadays, we mix it with APRF or we apply the bone graft material 
directly into the subcontrol volume we created, and then we apply the IPRF simply to speed up bone regeneration. Then afterwards, of course, you can insert the implants, and don't wait for me now to give you some tips, which is the minimum bone height you need to do simultaneous implant insertion. I don't know. I know for my implant system, which is the Q implant system, um, we should start with uh, immediate implant insertion, minimum bone height 3 millimeters. There are some implant systems that pretend to be able to do this with 2 millimeters, but I hope you listened to the speech of Dr. Pati before, who gave you some hints that this might be nice theory and it might work in some special hands, but it's not going to work for everybody. So this is the post-surgical CBCT control x-ray. The entire sinus floor was filled by one single approach. Here you can see the augmentation height was in this case more than 10 millimeters. This is the 3D reconstruction where you can see the bulge of the augmentation. And of course, once again, I want to show you an extreme case. In this case, we had to do the intramiv in the second polar region. And even if you do it in the second polar region, with one single approach, you are able to fill the entire sinus floor from distal to mesial. Because this is also important, even if you do only a sinus lift for one single implant on the first molar position, you never know if the patient might need later on, after 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, another implant in the second premolar region or in the, in, the, in the second molar region. So why not do it the sinus lift once and be prepared for all upcoming implants the, the patient might need in the future. In this case, we achieved an augmentation height of more than 40 millimeters, which enabled us to insert once again two single stage Q1 implants for pseudo-oriented loading. You can see in the second, the third X-ray. Uh, this is of course only a provisional out of occlusion. Uh, immediate loading with a sinus lift like this is not recommended. And this is the clinical situation. So with intralift, once you know how to do it, you can replace almost all other uh, lateral approach sinus lift techniques. Now let's speak another case. <coughs> Mandibular nerve lateralization. One of the biggest problems we have to face is the vertical atrophy of the lateral mandible. We can do osteodistraction, we can do subaerosal tunnel technique, but why not using the remaining bone of the patient, which is the most safe option we have? Until now, nerve lateralization was really a painful surgery, and almost nobody did it because the risk of a permanent lesion of the mandible nerve was simply too high. My personal record on nerve lateralization was a permanent anesthesia rate of approximately 6%, which is unacceptable, and the temporary hypesthesia was about 25%. And when I speak about temporary hypesthesia, I'm speaking about half a year, up to one year, where the patient still told me, it's still not the same like on the other side. So, nobody would do this because, once again, medical ethics demand don't do harm. The patient doesn't feel good if he has uh, um, fixed teeth in his mouth, if he doesn't feel the thing. Now, this has completely changed with the pizza dome. So, you can see one of the cases here, it's a 3, uh, 3D reconstruction. You can see the exit of the mental nerve, which is here. Here from uh, in another view. And this is the surgical procedure. What are we going to use to do this procedure? We use the saw to do the horizontal mesodistal cuts above the mandibular nerve and below the mandibular nerve. And we use a diamond called the bone scalpel, which originally was designed for lateral and bone sinus lifting, to do the vertical connection cut. And then we simply remove the bone and very carefully, this is shown in the next picture, uh, carefully we just take out the uh, mandibular nerve like this, fully unharmed. Then we do the drilling, we insert the implant, 
we put back the mandibular nerve as much as possible without tension, and then you do the sutures. It's simple implantology, most predictable implantology, because you're inserting the implant in the natural tone of the patient without any need of augmentation. And here is the final result. This is the post-surgical CBCD with the implants already loaded. And this is where you can see where the new mandibular nerve canal is. Because uh, once again, since we have periosteum, there will be a new mandibular nerve canal lateral of the implant. It's so easy. You just have to have the guts to do it. But once you do it once and you see how easy and nice it is, you don't think about vertical augmentation anymore. And this is only possible when you use pizza tones in your everyday office. Last but not least, and this is then uh, the final part of my lecture today, because I'm very proud it was exactly about four weeks ago. Um, maybe I was one of the first ones to introduce pizza tones also in cosmetic and reconstructive surgery of the face. And um, I'm very happy that the study is published now. It's the pizza tone rhinoplasty. Uh, there will be an online version soon available on the Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. And in Vienna, when I do noses, right now, my noses are the best. Why? Because I'm doing them with piezotone surgery. Least traumaticity like it is when you do intraoral surgery. Uh, much less edema and pain of the pain on the patient's side. Patients are much more happy and the outline of the nose contrary to osteotomies when you do rhinoplasties is much more perfect than ever is possible to do it with conventional instruments. And if you're interested in, um, let's say, our scientific research work and uh, you need some training how to get vitamins at homes, I will shortly give you uh, the links to our home pages. But now at the end of the lecture, I just want to ask you one very critical lecture. Hopefully, you all and me, we are healthy. But once in a while, we will need doctors ourselves. We will need surgeons. Maybe we will need abdominal surgery. So what would you choose if you are the patient? Would you choose to have a surgery like this or an endoscopic surgery like this? I already know the answer for myself. Please answer this question also for yourself. I am pretty sure you want to choose the right surgeon. And now I ask you a very critical question. Do you want to be treated like this? Or do you want to be treated like this? And once you are the patient, I'm pretty sure you're also choosing the right section. So, for this I thank you very, very much for your attention. It was a very intense lecture, very intense information. I hope I was able to give you the reason why you should start to think about changing your paradigm in oral surgery. And you find here, maybe you want to make a photo, uh, the lectures, all lectures and case presentations uh, we present worldwide, you can find on our homepage in the download section and the surgical training videos where we explain how you use the pizza bone surgery correctly in every single step with comments and with advices how to improve your work with pizza bones you find on our YouTube channel and constantly we add new cases and if you have requests you just send an email to our academy and we are glad if we can answer your questions. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, the chair. And I hope this will be one step into a new golden age of oral surgery with PhD goals, APRF, and self bargaining program materials. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.